Sven, maybe I can pass it over to you. I know it's an incredibly busy time for you at the moment. You produced a lot of papers, but we're also expecting some other papers coming out of the Commission in July. I pass over to you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. And hello, good morning, everyone. So I'll give a very brief overview of where we are in particular on the CSRD and ESRS, since this, I think, is the most pressing issue. And uh, as Nick said, my colleague uh, Jean-Christophe later on will take you in more detail through the ESG rating agency proposal that the Commission adopted last week and where we're very much looking forward on starting the negotiations under the Spanish presidency, who've already told us that they're very committed to this and we hope we'll, we'll still make, a, make good progress this year. But I'll start with ESRS and you're all aware, of course, that we've launched now the um, uh, final consultation on the first set of uh, sustainability reporting standards, which is going to run until the 7th of July, and uh, the Commission is planning to still adopt them before the summer break, so that means in July, uh, the Delegated Act um, to formally uh, adopt these, these standards. Now, um, you're also all aware, I guess, about the process that last year EFRAC provided us with a draft based on an extensive consultation, a very, very good process, I think, within EFRAC. Since last November, the Commission has been very busy looking at these standards and um, trying to improve them further. Um, I think there are three elements which I should mention as context. First of all, of course, we need to, need to make sure that all of the standards fit with the overall purpose, with the overall ambition of the CSRD and of our um, efforts in terms of sustainable finance. The sustainability crisis is by no means over. We're committed to the Green Deal. We have a very extensive and ambitious sustainable finance agenda and ESRS do play an important role here and are in a sense the, the missing element because we, we need the information from the corporates to feed into financial markets and then onto investors to make sure this, that this whole system works. At the same time, we're of course operating in very difficult economic circumstances at the moment. We had COVID and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, inflation, um, other elements, and that also needs to be taken into account. And you, you all know about the um, announcement of the Commission President that we're trying to reduce um, reporting burdens by 25% overall. Now, that doesn't necessarily translate into a one-to-one 25% -one reduction also on ESRS, but of course, we looked at ESRS again very closely and tried to make sure that they're really proportionate and that companies, preparers can deal with them and that they're fit for purpose. Um, we also tried very hard to respect the expertise of EFRAG because we think it's not the Commission's role to second guess technical choices that were made by EFRAG. They had a really extensive process, lots of different stakeholders involved and a lot of expertise. We also wanted to make sure that we keep the package together because we think it is important to put in place rules on E and S and G together. That's also the ambition of the CSRD. And then, as I said, in particular, we wanted to make sure that these rules are proportionate and that the, the companies that are not yet used to this kind of reporting, which are smaller type companies, companies that under the NFRD did not all of these things, um, that they have enough time to prepare. Now, if you look at the draft that we put out for a final comment period, you will see that the changes that we've made all go in this direction. So we've um, extended the materiality assessment basically to all the standards except for the cross-cutting one um, to allow also the companies that really do not have material operations in certain areas not to report, but everyone needs to assess first whether that's the case or not. And materiality assessment is not the same as voluntary. It still means that you need to properly look at this, that your auditor will probably look at this, that maybe your supervisor will look at that. And we do expect that the companies that do have material operations will also report on them. That's very important. We've introduced a number of additional phase-ins, in particular for companies below uh, 750 employees, because again, the consistent feedback that we had from industry, from stakeholders was that these kinds of companies smaller ones, even though 750 is already sizable, that they struggle on certain types of reporting. And you'll see it is about greenhouse gas emissions, scope three, uh, social issues, biodiversity, these kinds of things where we think more time will probably be helpful. Then a certain number of things have been made voluntary, which were mandatory before. 
Um, we've done a lot of work with the ISSB over the last year or so to make sure that the two standards, ours and theirs, are really interoperable, which concerns, mo concerns mostly climate. Uh, the ISSB, I think, is going to issue their standard next Monday. So everyone will really be in a position to put the two next to each other and see whether this works. And we'd be very keen to get your feedback. But we think we've really achieved a lot. I mean, we've had many sessions with them where we went through the two standards line by line and tried to make sure that everything fits together. And we do hope that we've come to a to a good result. So that's really what we've done overall. As I said, the the consultation will run until the 7th of July. We're very keen to learn from stakeholders whether there are still fatal flaws, things that don't work at all. At the same time, as you can imagine, we don't have an awful lot of time left after the consultation and we, there has a lot of work has already gone into these standards. So what I keep on saying is we've tried to make sure that the standards are proportionate and we would like to ask everyone to also provide us with proportionate replies in this consultation so that we have a possibility to still include them, but not, of course, rework this whole thing yet again, because we think we've come quite far now and we hope that this is really fit for purpose and can then um, can then apply as of next year. Just two more words. Um, we're working with AFRAC to make sure that enough guidance will be provided to everyone, because we know that's very important too. We'll hopefully be soon able to explain exactly where you need to turn if you have questions, who will answer them? Will it be EFRAC? Will it be us? What's the role of ESMA? What's the role of the supervisors? And we'll also try and give more clarity on the timing of the next steps, which is the standard for listed SMEs, a possible voluntary standard for non-listed SMEs and all the sectoral standards where for the time being we've asked EFRAC to deprioritize this work. But I think once the first set has been adopted by the Commission, we'll come back and give more clarity also in terms of the timing of these next steps. I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed for, for those uh, clarifying words, which I think are very reassuring. And I think Obviously, we are still going through the draft text, but so far, happy to report, we have not seen any fatal flaws. And, and I think you will, might, might, there might be one or two small suggestions, but nothing significant. So we recognize the tightness of your timetable and the ambition around that. And, and I think actually many of those comments might be around what you've just said, alignment with the ISSB. And I think it's good that timing-wise, the ISSB is coming out in time to allow the two texts to be compared, as you pointed out. Maybe one, starting with one of the questions, which is, and it goes beyond the remit of your own unit, but feedback that we've had so far from financial service industries, the link between the standards and the compliance with the SFDR, which of course is also going to being reviewed, at, not reviewed, but there's an implementation report being prepared. How do you see that interrelationship? Um, will, will kind of the revised standards with the materiality assessment deliver what investors need uh, to comply with the SFDR, in your opinion? Yes. No, I mean, we've also had the same comments, and I know that there is some concern in particular among the investors, given that they've already been subject to the SFDR now for a while, and the SFDR has clear requirements in terms of what financial market participants need to report. Everyone's been waiting, in a sense, for um, the corporates to also be subject to clear requirements. And there is a concern that has been brought to our attention that if corporates are not obliged to report, does that mean that investors will not get all the information that they need? Now, we don't think there will be an issue because, as I said, um, under ESRS, it's not that we've turned this to voluntary. Um, the preparers need to apply a proper materiality assessment, a materiality assessment that will also be looked at by the auditor that for certain companies listed and so on, will also be looked at by the supervisor possibly. And I think it, this will ensure that all the information that is needed, that is material, that is relevant, will be provided. Um, at the same time, it will give fl flexibility in the sense that really small companies, companies with not material, not relevant operations will not have to go through certain standards in full, um, but can simply explain that they think they have no material operations here. So I, I don't have this concern. Also, when I talk to the colleagues in the asset management unit who are in charge of SFDR, they also don't have this concern. But of course, we're taking the questions by stakeholders very seriously, and we'll look at it also once more after the consultation. Um, 
to make double sure that, um, that, that the two pieces of law work together. Thanks, Sven. And maybe follow up on the materiality assessment. As you say, you're leaving a bit more discretion to the corporates now and that there aren't mandatory elements. It is, it's not voluntary, you're right, you have to go through all the different steps, but ultimately much more judgment is being left to the individual corporates. We get a number of questions related to this. Now, maybe that's answered in the guidance that is likely to still be issued, that you say, because we're getting questions about materiality within different entities within a group, for example. It might not be material for the group as a whole, it might be material for an individual entity. But in the overall percentage of turnover or, or business, it might not be big, uh, but it could be significant in an individual member state. All these type of questions around structure, maybe that's one question. And the second one is kind of, uh, you know, materiality or judgment is in the eye of the beholder. It's one of the reasons why you're doing the sustainability uh, uh, rating proposal. But, but how do you say there'll be a role for the supervisors, there'll be a role for the auditors, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit more as to how we over time get a common understanding as to the judgment around materiality and to what extent the guidance that you're referring to will kind of contribute to that. I think it's exactly as you say, we will need to provide further guidance and EFRAG is exactly working on this at the moment because I know or we know that everyone expects further clarification around how to do this materiality test. Um, everyone is used to it on the on the financial reporting side and I think there it, there's the common standards and, and approaches. In terms of sustainability, it's of course different because the question is, what is the relevant comparison? Do I compare myself to my peers? Do I compare myself to a certain region? Do I compare myself to certain goals? What is it? And I think all of these elements need to be further clarified. There is a role for EFRAG. There is a role probably for the auditors. There is a role for practice to be established. And uh, but it's clear that we now need to make sure together with EFRAG that, that further guidance is provided because it is challenging. I, I, I agree with that. Nevertheless, again, I, I don't think that, we don't think there will be an issue. Yes, I see in the chat that someone said that the uh, principal adverse indicators um, under the SFDR are not subject to materi materiality. That is correct. But even with um, reporting subject to materiality under ESRS, we still believe that um, all the relevant data, all the relevant information will be provided for the market. Thank you. Um, and I think taking a bit uh, a step further, um, you also reference kind of the, the overlap or interaction between the standards and other sector pieces of legislation. Because of course, we've got a lot of standards in place at the sector level, and it's being referenced uh, in, in the Delegated Act but maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that, in particular as the Fit for 55 package goes through and as over time we can assume that the standards at the sec in the sector legislation will become tougher, how that might translate back into the reporting framework. Well, I mean, there are two elements here, I think. First of all, yes, of course, we are operating in a, in a very clearly defined political environment with very clear goals and the European Union has taken the approach of legally setting itself goals and legally also trying to put the, the, the means in place to, to achieve those. Now CSRD in a sense is a is a, a, um, a vehicle to make sure that the information is provided. It's not a behavioral piece of legislation. It doesn't tell companies you have to do this, you don't have to do that. It doesn't even tell you that you have to have a transition plan. It says if you have one, you need to report the following things. So I think overall, it leaves a lot of space still for companies in terms of um, what they do. But at the same time, as you said, there is a lot of sector legislation that does tell companies very clearly what needs to be done. And I think that's actually a good split because we've overall taken the approach in terms of sustainable finance that we, we mostly want to make sure that the information is properly provided to markets. The, the, the say really binding rules in terms of behavior come from somewhere else. They come either from, I don't know, building codes or other codes in terms of uh, transport, uh, airlines, what have you, all the fit for 55 elements, or there is also, of course, the CS Triple D, 
which is being negotiated at the moment, which also might have a certain um, effect, where there are already space holders, if you want, for, for due diligence. And I mean, reporting without referring to, uh, to due diligence probably doesn't make sense anymore. Um, but that's an element that once the negotiations on the CSDD are concluded, we might have to come back uh, and revise the ESRS slightly, depending on the, out, on the outcome of the negotiations on the CSDD. Yeah, we are used to tweaks to legislation at this stage, Sven. I know we all want legal certainty, but I think in one in this area we have only one certainty. The rules will get tougher and tougher as we move towards 2030. Um, maybe uh, the other question that came in from Simone, which I think is a good one. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure you can answer. You get this question all the time. The Commission gets it all the time. But of course, there's this understanding that if you are ISSB compliant for the climate piece, obviously, it's a much narrower scope at the moment, that you could assume that that is then equivalent. You don't have to do a an, an, uh, kind of EU CSRD separate reporting for those elements. But maybe you can explain how you think this might potentially fit together. Yeah. Well, and I'd actually read the question the other way around, which said, so, so if you're subject to ESRS, will you then be considered equivalent to ISSB, since we have a legal requirement? international equivalence, so that's why I turned the question. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, in a sense, we, we, we would hope that there would be a signal also from the ISSB to say that, look, if you report according to ESRS, you fulfill our requirements or most of our requirements. As I said, we've gone through this and we think there is almost nothing in terms of what would not be bet in the ISSB standards if you report according to ESRS. Um, there's one little element on financed emissions and there's something around uh, greenhouse gas um, because we take a slightly different approach for good reasons, I think. Um, but overall, I think we hopefully will be able to say in one way or another how exactly the two interrelate. Now, I don't think there will be a formal equivalence decision, I think. First of all, the ISSB, I don't think, has this kind of structure in any case. Um, and on our side, um, I think it will take us quite some time to come to the stage where we take equivalence decisions, because also in the CSRD it says for that um, the other comparable standard needs to cover basically everything that we cover as well, which for the time being is not the case for the ISSB because it's mostly climate. Um, but having said that, what we would like to get to is something where it, which gives a lot of clarity to users, to investors, to preparers. How do the two interrelate? What exactly is the same, is interoperable? And what are the few remaining differences and for whatever reasons? And I think then it should be fairly easy for anyone to either, if they prepare their reports under ESRS, to then do whatever is needed uh, in, in addition to also comply with ISSB or the other way around, or for users of these reports to really clearly understand um, how the two interrelate and, and, and use them. And on, on top of that, of course, there'll also be a digital taxonomy where we're also trying to cooperate with the ISSB to make sure that this fits and that it re can really be easily used so that you can access the information whichever way you think is most useful for you. You raised the question of transition plans and, and yes, it's referenced, as you say, in the CSRD. But uh, I think if I were to summarize a little bit what I see in the market, there's increasing focus on transition planning and the design of the transition plans and the comparability of transition plans. The European framework is still relatively silent on it, although you provided also separately uh, a week ago or so when the proposal came out some guidance around this. It's still relatively high level guidance. How do you see that guidance fit into the process and should the industry over time potentially anticipate more, more kind of codification around that? Yeah, no, I, it, I think it's become obvious that this, this question of transition and how to do it and how to plan for it and how to report on it is key and has to be key because uh, pretty much everyone has to go through a transition now. And, uh, and I think lots of uh, investors and other market participants want to understand from companies how exactly they plan for that and say more coherence uh, on, on that is also, is also useful and needed. So that's why we issued that communication last week, which gives clear, uh, I think, indications on how we see this, what role the taxonomy can play on transition, what role other pieces of legislation can play on that. Um, 
for the time being, we're not planning to come with anything further binding, prescriptive, what have you. Um, but as you said before, uh, we have to watch this space because the the pressure on all of us is not going away. And the goals that we've set ourselves, rightfully so and necessarily so, um, they are ambitious. And to meet them, I think lots of things need to happen between now and 2030 and 2050. Um, you mentioned some of the upcoming work that you're doing, and you referred already to the standards for listed SMEs and then mentioned the sector ones, because originally the plan was to come with the sector ones first over a three year period by prioritization and then in parallel work on the SME standards. Um, maybe it's difficult to say much more about that at the moment, but of course a lot of focus has gone into the sector ones, and in particular those for, for high emission se in sectors or sectors that are more impactful, let's put it like that, than others. Um, Maybe you can elaborate a little bit the thinking around that, because if we look to other parts of the world, for example, that are not necessarily following the taxonomy, like Japan, uh, Tomo Ishikawa will moderate the next panel, they take a different approach. They kind of require particular disclosure requirements on the high emission sectors first, and then they roll it out over time to less impactful ones. Uh, and in the way we explained it in the sector context, a bit in the same way at the European level, but maybe just give a sense because we get a lot of questions about the future of the sector uh, standards. Yes, so as, as I said, for the time being, we've asked EFRA to deprioritize the work on the sectoral standards and rather focus on providing guidance because we think that's the most pressing. At the commission's level, we want to make sure now that we get this first set of standards established. Um, where there's still a bit of work to do, given that the consultation is running and the commission needs to adopt the delegated act. Once that has happened, I think we are in a position to then give more clarity on the timing of the remaining work. What is clear to us is that in particular the, sect, uh, the standards for the SMEs, for the listed SMEs, but also um, a voluntary standard for non-listed SMEs are probably quite urgent because we get lots of feedback from SMEs that they would like to have further guidance, that they would like to have, if you want more coherence also um, in the value chain, what they're supposed to report. There's a lot of concern that reporting requirements will filter down to SMEs that are not covered by the CSRD in such a way that it's difficult for these SMEs to deal with these reporting requirements. And they would like to see some kind of framework that will help them understand better what they need to do. And maybe also make sure that they're not faced with reporting requirements in the value chain that go beyond what they think they're capable of doing. So that's why we are, um, we'll be looking at that also again, together with AFRAC, how to do that. Under the CSRD, we are required to establish a standard for listed SMEs. There's no requirement for non-listed. However, as I said, the Commission is looking at establishing something through a recommendation um, that would also help the non-listed SMEs, but we would base ourselves also for this on the work of EFRAG. Um, they would still need to do a consultation, which could happen in the second half of this year. But then the exact timing in terms of when we will adopt this, um, we need to look at once more. The, the listed SMEs will have to report as of 2026, plus a two-year phase where they can still opt out if they don't think they're in a position to do that. So in that sense, there is not, not so much urgency, but we understand there is urgency because lots of listed, but also non-listed SMEs think that a standard for them would help them um, in their dealings with their customers in the value chain and all of that. And we do understand that. Yeah, and I think you made that point, the reference to CSDD before, and I think the reference to the value chain is creating that urgency. And you're right, we are getting the feeling that there will be quite a bit of de facto market-driven reporting by SMEs, and that, and that the deadlines you set give a bit of flexibility, but we'll see how much market discipline will drive companies to want to report quicker. Maybe one last uh, comment, because we're running out of time. Um, what would you like to see from the industry? And, and uh, you know, as, as we're going through this morning, if, if we were to define a success for this morning's discussion other than education and awareness, what would be useful for you, Sven, to come back to you uh, this afternoon with one or two findings out of the discussions this morning? 
well, as as you said, if there if there are fatal flaws, if there are really issues where you think we still have to adjust slightly, it's good for us to know, and it's good for us to know as soon as possible, because that will give us a bit more time to still do things. And then at the same time, I think now it's important to kind of collectively together try and find ways how to implement this because it's a challenge for everyone it's a challenge for the preparers it's a challenge for the supervisors for the auditors and we we, we need to put our heads together to to make sure that that this works properly i think a lot of good work has been done now i think the esrs from our point of view are in a in a good shape now there's a lot of work being done by efrac preparing for guidance and all of that but i think it needs this kind of constructive spirit from everyone um going forward so that we make this work. Uh, I want to wish you good luck, you and the team, good luck with that work and to July. Yeah. And, and hopefully you get it done and get a deserved summer break as well once it's done before you start the next round of consultations. Sven, it was a real pleasure speaking to you and thanks for your clarity and, and openness around the thinking. And as I say, if anything emerges from this discussion today, which I very much hope, we will be in touch and, and give you a debrief. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you and have a good day.